This is a story about a real event and a real person. Characters are about real people. The event took place 17 years ago and was not brought to trial. Another event took place 43 years ago and no one spoke about it. Events like this continue to happen daily in this country and around the world. Today, this could be a real trial. I am Dr. Calvin Chatlos, professor of psychiatry at Rutgers University, and this story has to be told. In order to involuntarily commit someone, which is the euphemism for psychiatric imprisonment, the state has to prove by clear and convincing evidence that as a result of mental illness, the person is a danger of serious harm to himself or themselves or others, or so disabled that they are unable to survive safely in freedom. And even if so, they have to prove that there's no less restrictive alternative. For uh, forced drugging, the state has to prove that the person is incompetent to decline the medication, which is a farce all in itself, and that the, uh, the psychiatric drugs are in their best interest and there's no less intrusive alternative available. The numbers of people getting forcibly hospitalized and forcibly treated has actually been rising dramatically for decades. In British Columbia, doubling. In Ontario, doubling. In California, 30-day detentions tripled. Child detainees tripled. In Colorado, doubling. Nevada, doubling. Indiana, doubling. Florida, doubling. Do drugs that we're using for mental health, psychiatric drugs, do they do more long-term harm than good? Oh, these drugs fix a chemical balance in the brain like insulin for diabetes. We tell people this because it becomes an explanation they can understand as to why they should take the drug. I was a kid when I was first put on antidepressants and I just did what the adults told me to do and I took a pill if I had a headache and I took pills for what they told me I needed. And so it wasn't until I was 30 years old when I realized I had never had an unmedicated moment as mm -hmm. an adult and I was still suicidal and severely depressed so something wasn't working yeah. here. And so I just decided, okay, I need to figure out how to get off these drugs and discover my baseline. But I went to a doctor who didn't know what she was talking about and she pulled me off way too quickly and I was plunged mm -hmm. into severe antidepressant withdrawal. Well, first of all, a black box warning is the most serious of all warnings that the FDA issues. At that point in 2003, we started going out. 2004, we met a lot of families and these hearings it's amazing what the power of people and people like you and I, everyday people who've had experiences when they show up and tell their story. 49% of Americans have reported having a significant spiritual or religious experience that changed their worldview, that changed, changed them. That's a significant number. That's a significant number of people that have never talked about their experiences because they're afraid of being ridiculed or shamed or having the sacredness of their experience taken away from them. Very often, they're very difficult to describe. And when you do try to describe these experiences, you cannot convey um, the actual experience. I was very, very dissatisfied with the fact that uh, traditional psychiatrists call these states altered states. I see it in a kind of a pejorative term that doesn't reflect, you know, how much respect I have for them. But I was particularly interested in uh, these uh, non-ordinary states that are healing, that are transformative, that are potentially uh, evolutionary, and um, that also have what we call heuristic value, which is that they can bring uh, absolutely new information about the psyche, about uh, human nature, about the nature of reality. So those would be states that, uh, for example, the shaman's experience is part of the initiatory crisis, or states that native cultures experience in rites of passage or some other powerful uh, rituals, uh, the kind of states that the initiates experience in ancient mysteries of death and rebirth in Egypt, and in Greece and other, you know, other places. 
the experiences that uh, people have in different forms of yoga, in uh, different forms of Buddhism, uh, the Sufis experience, the Christian mystics, the, the Kabbalists and so on. And it's, it was just unbelievable to me that <clears throat> we don't uh, have a special name for them. We put everything into that one bag of uh, altered states and the, the uh, implication is that they are all pathological. You see, the, we don't have a category, uh, a spiritual experience, a mystical experience. So anybody who has any kind of episode of non-ordinary states would be seen as mentally ill and would be getting medication and a diagnosis and so on. So when we did a lot of work with these states uh, and we discovered the, the healing and the transformative potential, uh, we started uh, calling these spontaneous states uh, spiritual emergencies or psycho-spiritual crisis. And so much of our work was actually supporting people who had spontaneous episodes rather than suppressing the experience was to actually encouraging people to, to go into it and, and through it. I conducted my doctorate research on uh, spiritual emergence, spiritual emergency, and, uh, and how trauma is connected to this topic. Uh, so research has shown that uh, clients do want to have spirituality integrated into therapy. Uh, research has also shown that the helping professions uh, have done a fairly poor job at integrating spirituality into therapy. Uh, most importantly, uh, cultural competence is an ethical principle that uh, help the helping professions um, need to abide by. And there are many spiritual uh, phenomena uh, in different cultures that um, the helping professions need to be aware of. If you are experiencing overwhelm because of these experiences, and then you are not properly supported as one should be supported when you're experiencing trauma, which is to be offered a safe, supportive environment, uh, mistreatment of trauma or mistreatment of a spiritual emergency can then be even more traumatizing. Spirituality is a very important piece of the human experience. And I think that um, validating uh, spirituality is very important. Spiritual competency is now recognized as a core part of cultural competency throughout the healthcare field. Spirituality and religion really do qualify as aspects of diversity in the same league of importance as ethnicity, race, gender, and sexual orientation. And yet, as we both know from our own training, spirituality and religion are ignored in the main training programs that exist. One of the reasons that we think there has been this oversight is that there is a lack of validated guidelines for spiritual and religious competency. Which may appear to be mental disorders may in fact be religious or spiritual conflicts. The acceptance of this new category was an important milestone in the growing recognition of mystical experiences And I've been including spirituality and psychiatric care with my patients for over 30 years. I too experienced profound spiritual experiences along with brief psychotic episodes, but I was not hospitalized given the support system of my colleagues who may not have understood, but were protected. I'm Joshua Roberts, CEO of Inspired Mind Mental Health LLC. I'm also a presenter with the nation's largest mental health organization, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, training in neurodiversity gifts and unpacking these new things that society is witnessing emerge. And guess what? I was hospitalized two, six times involuntarily against my will. 
smacked the label of bipolar one on me, which led to all sorts of trauma and pain. And when I was hospitalized, there was very little to no exploration of the spiritual dimensions of my experience. But I learned later on, I got my master's degree in theology from Fuller Theological Seminary, that there's so much validation in world religions for these kinds of experiences. My world now is better than it ever was before. And I think we're witnessing something profound happening right here through our stories and the coming together of those stories. It was like I would suddenly have something which will make me feel so good, so ecstatic, as if something is opening up in me. So how I understand this experience is that my psyche was going through some shift. Yeah. I, was, uh, I was not able to make sense of it, what's going on. But there was a tremendous amount of energy that my body was not able to handle. The energy was trying to do something. It was making a shift in my mind or whatever was going on. And I was, you know, I was building these stories maybe that, you know, I'm called upon something or whatever. But uh, the the whole idea is that um, I, I was not able to explain it to my husband what's going on. And he was feeling that something is wrong with me, but I was tired and I needed, I think I needed space or somebody whom I can trust, who can make me feel safe. And the doctor was called who, uh, with their permission, of course, he sedated and I was taken to a hospital. And um, that was traumatic, of course. I knew what's going on. I tried to stop them, I, I resisted but it was forceful, I was sedated. All we need to do is let it pass, it, it passes. It's not something that has to be um, seen with the view that we have to stop it. I tried to introduce a conversation with the psychiatrist, psychologists, and the psych nurses. I offered explanations and alternative frameworks for my mystical and spiritual experiences. However, these were seen solely through the eyes of psychopathology, through the lens of psychopathology. And in that setting, there was no room for my views and my interpretations. I was given a very dehumanizing clinical gaze as I expressed my experiences, and everything was fit into a very narrow and incorrect box um, to align with current diagnoses. Everything that I shared, you know, from the depths of my soul, and these are common experiences that are very human, was looked at without any sense that there was a human being speaking. The challenging spiritual experiences are not pathological. They can require care because of their intense nature, but they are to be seen as more complex and definitely not a biomedical, um, they don't have biomedical origin. So I presented this to my psychiatrist in the hospital and then to my psychologist as an outpatient, and neither of them was willing, even though it was in the DSM, to explore this, there was just, that was a dead end. I served on the board of a temple. I had held a position. I had been the president of a condo association. I had, I mean, I was a well-respected person. I was the person that people came to for advice. I helped other people. So I did have some credibility. And if that could happen to me, that could happen to anybody. So, I do feel, I do feel that this is part of my purpose. And to add to, because it's coming to me now as I'm speaking, part of what I do now is I engage in conversations with lots of people, again, still trying to draw bridges. What I, and I, and I speak to a lot of very intellectual people. So I speak to people that are studying the brain, people that are involved in technology, I am very much wanting to have conversations with those people. So in terms of the work that we're doing, where I see it could attach to what I'm doing, are having these kind of conversations where we rethink the way we think about mental wellness. And I don't call it mental illness because 
personally, I think the the disease model, the mental illness part, I really think that's a small fraction. It was took place in mental institutions. And these mental institutions did not understand either what I was going through. They had a very reductive way of looking at my process. For them, it was brain chemistry and balance, and it had to be medicated. And they had absolutely no knowledge whatsoever about the traumas, the fears that I was processing. I also would have loved to know that I was not only processing my own traumas but I, and my own irrationality, but in many aspects, I was also pro processing traumas from society and irrational way of thinking that are deep rooted in our social structures. Uh, I didn't have that. And I was lucky I made it on the other side because I think a lot of people without that understanding really come to believe that they are chronically mentally ill and, and end up spending their life on medication. And I think this is uh, absolutely dramatic. And the consequence of this reductive materialist ways of looking at human beings and, and their psychology. I too have been someone who has been labeled and diagnosed and hospitalized involuntarily against my will. I was not given any choice in, in taking the cocktail of the antipsychotics. I was not, um, you know, um, in any way, shape or form um, told why I needed them. Uh, I just was, was given them and told to take them. I know that my, I had several family members accusing me of having a chemical imbalance, that that was the, the main culprit um, involved with why I'd had, um, you know, what were considered to be delusions and hallucinations instead of um, being able to be spiritually sensitive enough to, um, to sense the presence of a higher power. My only issues that I needed to work through were pe other people's disbelief. Yes. You know, like, like if I had had one person in my life, one family member, one, one friend say, hey, Laura, you know, what, it, what you're going through sounds just like, uh, you know, a stage, a very murky and oceanic and confusing, discombobulating stage of a spiritual awakening, I would have been like, oh, you know, I believe that probably a whole lot of our psychiatrists uh, in this world who are so overworked, so overwhelmed with, with cases, um, have, you know, their, their quotas, whatever it be, you know, that keeps them just in perpetual go mode, right? Um, they probably can barely keep up with the the new diagnoses and reading about reading all these different papers and all the different you know things that are happening that um, the progress that's made. Um, I would think that would be a very difficult thing to keep up with. So I would think that they you know it's probably one of the reasons that you see labels like bipolar become so incredibly um, popular. I went to school for two years and completed a program in psychosocial rehabilitation. And I've been around the world studying mental wealth and mental health with people from all walks of life. And I too was admitted against my will to psychiatric institutions six times in my 20s. I myself uh, experienced, uh, I had a spiritual emergency and um, I could not find any help at the time. Uh, to help me with my spiritual emergency. Um, like many of my clients, I also felt uh, trepidation about speaking with a helping professional. I started thinking that I was crazy, and that's the problem, right? Because there's no, there's no uh, venue of conversation, because this is not, because this hasn't been normalized, because it's not, because it isn't okay to talk about this topic. Um, you start thinking there's something wrong with you. And I remember praying and calling out to God. I just said, take this pain away, take this fear away. I have no idea how I'm gonna function um, to complete my masters and et cetera. 
And literally, this is the moment, in an instant, it felt like there was a lightning bolt that struck me right in my forehead. I can't explain it any other way. And all of a sudden, the pain was gone, the, the fear was gone, um, and it was like this miraculous moment. And I really didn't think a whole lot about it. It was just, this is cool. Forced hospitalization can feel like an assault on the individual by the mental health system. Janet Werner was not only assaulted and falsely accused of being bipolar in 1979, she endured 25 years of struggle to clarify a serious misdiagnosis, resulting in navigating stigma, prejudice, suppression, depression, loss of her voice and agency, only to be assaulted again by limited thinking within the mental health system in 2005. Janet Werner had an extraordinary spiritual experience with an acute psychotic episode that would have resolved on its own without meds. Medications can dull a person and may lead to further misdiagnosis created by the medications. Her spiritual experience should have been respected. The standard of care should have included spiritual support. She does not have a bipolar disorder diagnosis. Calling God to the witness stand is a signature as to this new movement, this new understanding that's dawning into the minds of humanity. It's larger than me. It's larger than you. It's ours. It's our movement. And I'm honored to be alive at this particular time to share it with you. I think that by having experts question and experience her and have this debate around it, uh, they're going to be able to, uh, the, uh, the observer, the witness of this movie, is going to be able to hear this from a different perspective. When I think about the possibilities of a movie that has charm, wit, um, intrigue, also extremely real pain and challenge and the ways we don't treat each other the way we could and should, um, I think this this one really has the potential to highlight challenges within the mental health industry, how people have been treated sometimes with the best of intentions, but still things haven't been done as well as they might be. And I think it can shed light on that and also help us rethink how we undertake mental health and the convergence with spiritual, uh, our spiritual lives and be a very entertaining movie all at the same time. This film is extremely timely given the growing momentum to dismantle psychiatric systems. It is a watershed project that exposes the failings of these systems. I have no doubt that it will empower clientele to demand change, be shown in universities around the world, and inspire people to create a new and better system. I think that this film is so important because there is a huge community of people out there that is unfortunately growing all the time, of people who have had their emotions, their spiritual experiences, their human experience uh, diseaseified by this system of psychiatry and um, as a result put on or even forced onto drugs that are extremely dangerous in long-term use for a lot of people. I really believe that this kind of movie is very important, uh, specifically now, because I do believe that we are standing at the precipice of a new day, one in which uh, we as a society collectively and individually can begin to recognize that we are all spiritual beings on a trajectory of growth that is meant to be never ending. And frankly, we could just keep it at that and, and figure out the specifics of that at some point, you know, later on, that'd be awesome. But, but really, you know, just to be able to recognize that the entire world is experiencing the beginning of what feels to be a true global awakening and that we're all at different stages of that awakening, whether we're conscious of, of that or not. And I, I do think that pathologizing these experiences is um, does such a dishonor to the true nature of what it means to be human. We're now talking about two in eight people or two in nine people who are living with a mental disorder right now. 
And we want to ask ourselves a number of questions with those statistics, those, those disturbing statistics, and say, how many of those people right now are not aware that they're just going through a spiritual crisis that has led to a mental illness? And how many of those people were denied access to healthcare or have no access to mental health care at all? Which means that they're denied of their basic human rights. And how many of people who are able to access basic uh, mental care were misdiagnosed and suffered unnecessarily because there was no training about identifying a spiritual crisis that has led to a mental illness. So this movie is very, very important because it's a platform and it's a way of reaching out to millions and billions of people who need help and can get access to it. I think it has multiple values. I think um, for... I think there are many people who are having similar experiences and they don't know where to turn to for help. So I think uh, just by depicting a case, because this is essentially a case study, uh, just by depicting a case uh, on a um, on a broad scale such as this, you you reach a lot of people who may be going through similar experiences and that it uh, hopefully connects them to resources that are better able to support them. That's the first one. And then secondly, if this uh, project can uh, influence some change within the helping professions and also within educational systems uh, to provide better training, better understanding, um, then that would be fantastic as well, because I think that the system needs to change uh, in order to meet uh, clients where they're at. And um, spiritual needs are very important. And um, I think we could do better. Calling God to witness is a weapon. And we believe that once this move is out, it's going to transform lives of many people. It's going to shape minds of different kind of people with different uh, post portfolios to understand and to respect the people who are facing some kind of spiritual awakening. Those people who are facing a lot of uh, uh, calling from God, they should be respected. And the people should understand that if mental illness and call from God and the issues of shamanic are, are need to be treated differently. So I really appreciate for this calling to God witness because uh, I am now able to understand deeper things. I think this movie is incredibly important because it's incredibly important to shine a light on what is happening to almost a generation of young people right now. This kind of movie for me is paramount of importance. We will prove beyond any reasonable doubt that this medical report is inaccurate and highly prejudicial and that this woman was falsely diagnosed of a mental illness that was not present. She was accused of being a danger to herself and others, which she wasn't. She was misdiagnosed, labeled, stigmatized, and her human rights to freedom were removed by the state based on false information in her medical report. Facts that were easily verified were not checked. She did not have her day in hospital court in 2005 as required by law, but she is having her day in court now, not just for herself, but for all of the innocent victims who had their rights taken away from them with forced medication and institutionalized against their will. If you don't think that this can happen to you, think again.